Hello, and welcome to the discussion series of Buddha Nights. I am Munira Hashemi, playwright, actor, and director. In 2005, I co-founded Simor Film Association of Culture and Art in Herat, west of Afghanistan. March 11, 2013, I co-founded A Night with Buddha Festival to commemorate the destruction of world cultural heritage, the Buddha statues in Bamiyan. The destruction of Buddha statues in 2001, which carried out in the continuation of decades of ethnic cleansing with the aim of destroying the history of Hazara people was beyond massacre. It was a cultural genocide. 21 years later after destruction, even the remains, the empty niches of Buddha statues are again in danger in Bamiyan. This year, we at Theater Deuce, with collaboration of Safe Heaven Freedom Talks, arrange a series of discussion to understand the different aspects of destruction of cultural heritage, destroying history, forced forgetting, social discrimination, and genocide against Hazara people. Our guests for these discussions are Ali Karimi and Abdullah Mohammadi. Ali Karimi is a postdoctoral fellow in the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. He studies the history and politics of technology with a focus on the information and governance. Ali holds a PhD in communication studies from McGill University, a master degree in communication from the University of Ottawa and bachelor degree in film studies from Kabul University. Ali is currently working on his book project that deals with the history of information in Afghanistan. Abdullah Mohammadi is a researcher contributing to Mixed Migration Center in Asia region. His main research interests are migration culture and forced displacement among Afghans. Besides his research, he has translated many books on Afghanistan society and politics. Abdullah holds a master's degree in demography and is studying ethnic and migration studies in Linköping University, Sweden. This discussion will be moderated by Asad Buddha. Asad Buddha is a freelance writer. He studied sociology and Islamic theology and has worked as a lecturer and researcher in Kabul. He is the former icon guest writer in Karlstad. That Otervendande Ogat, a chapter of his personal memoir, was published in Vanland Writers Anthology. He has worked with Rick's Theater and Theater Deuce on a project called Little History, resulted in publishing a book under the title of Hoppet's Territorium. Southern Stars and Homo Saker of Fogla Napolinia Gatan are his last published texts in the Oud Ok Bild and Gobet Brewster Art Gallery. He is also involved in visual art, focusing on the demonization of political enemies and aesthetic aspects of extremist and religion violences. <clears throat> Now we take one minute silence for the last shocking attacks on Hazara people in Afghanistan. In these attacks, over 300 people were injured and 250 people were killed. 126 of those who were killed were school students. Thank you. 
Thank you, dear Ali and Abdullah, for being with us. As that, now I leave the platform for you and our honored guest. Uh, thank you, Munir, uh, Meltem, and Theater Dus and Freedom Talk. And welcome to uh, Ali and Abdullah for uh, this discussion uh, today on the title of Destroying History, Herbicide, and Destruction of Cultural Heritage in Bongyang. In 2001, the Taliban shook war by blowing off statue, statues of Buddha in Bongyang, Afghanistan. Violence is not new to Bamiyan. The Valley of Bamiyan has documented its own history. When one enters the city, the first thing I see is the absence of Buddha statues at the heart of Bamiyan mountain. The empty niche not only shows the distraction of Buddha statue, but also the cultural genocide against the urban life that has been a part of the history of the valley. The destruction of Bamiyan Buddha was one of the most horrific cultural crime in the recent memory. In this talk, we will look at the destruction of history and why what's happened in Bamiyan is more than a case of violence against the material heritage. In fact, it was a form of violence against the species of urbanity, civility, against the Hazara people history, and against a long history of cooperation and coexistence in Bamiyan. Today, we will talk with Ali and Abdullah. I want to start uh, with Ali Karimi. Uh, Ali, let's unpack the our title. Uh, let's uh, unpack our title. Can you explain what destroying history means? How do we conceptualize the destruction of cultural heritage in Bamiyan? Thank you, Asad, uh, for the um, uh, question. I also want to thank Munira for the introductions and uh, Milton and Safe Haven uh, Freedom Talks for organizing this event. It is an honor to be here. Uh, destroying uh, history is, um, is, is a deliberate act of violence against historical evidence. Um, it is a political act uh, for the purpose of editing the past, erasing some part of the past, creating a new narrative about history in order to create a story that would fit with the narratives of the ruling class and also a story that would justify the power of the ruling class. So uh, this type of violent destruction of uh, historical sites happens sometimes during warfare, when two nations are in, in, in war or there is one nation uh, engaged in civil war. Uh, this type of violence is important because uh, history is important. Uh, the stories we tell about ourselves, the stories we tell about our origin, about our culture, about our um, identity matters a lot. And it's very contested, not only in a place like Afghanistan, which is very unstable and doesn't have um, uh, democratic governance, but also in more stable liberal democracies too. Uh, the past is not settled. It is always negotiated. It's always debated, although not violently, but the debate about the past is an ongoing process. Because as social scientists would say, uh, our uh, nation states are uh, tied together mostly based on some shared phenomenon. One of these shared phenomenon is the stories that people tell about themselves. In, uh, in authoritarian states, the debate and the contestation about the past is more serious and sometimes more violent. In the Soviet Union, there was a joke 
that that in so in the Soviet Union the future is certain. It is the past that is unpredictable, because with each regime change, a new narrative about the past would emerge that would highlight certain part of the past and erase the other parts. In Afghanistan, uh, Nile Green, a historian of Afghanistan, uh, says that uh, about the contestation about history that two figures in Afghanistan have been the most influential in shaping political events. One is Mujahid, the other is Muarrikh. Mujahid is the Islamic fighters and Muarrikh means uh, historians. They have been engaged in this first ideological battle in shaping the identity of Afghanistan and the history of Afghanistan. The distractions that Afghanistan heritage has seen uh, over the past, let's say a century, uh, the, the biggest one would be the destruction of Buddhas in Bamiyan, uh, have also been a form of orbicide. Orbicide means, literally means killing of the city. When there is a war, uh, you are uh, trying to kill not only people, but also deny the people the infrastructure, the built environment that sustain them. When it comes to cultural heritage, the distraction of the people's cultural heritage means that you are trying to erase their evidence, the evidence of their existence in history. Um, th this uh, form of violence, uh, the concept of herbicide comes from political uh, geography and uh, geographers have uh, talked about the uh, urban warfare in the Middle East, uh, in Eastern Europe, in the Balkans, and also we can explain uh, the war in Afghanistan, the civil war and the Taliban war as a form of war against the city, about a, a war against civility and community. And uh, this distraction is not only a form of destroying history, that deliberate destruction of historical evidence, but also part of this larger movement in Afghanistan, this nationalistic movement in Afghanistan to edit the past, to erase the past in order to build new stories uh, in their place. I'm sure that uh, Abdullah is going, uh, is going to discuss this further also and uh, we will come to this uh, question later. But uh, in terms of uh, understanding this, this violence against the cultural uh, heritage sites, one way to look at it is through the concept of herbicide, a form of violence against the built environment. So you mean uh, what's happened in Bamiyan is uh, we need a new concept, a new uh, framework for that, and it's maybe not possible to just explain by genocide. So we need the uh, other concept, which is orbicide. Uh, the same happened in the Syria uh, by Daesh in in Iraq, and today maybe in Ukraine when the Putin ordered people to leave the city, and after they are living, so uh, he destroyed. So we need is, a new. That is a very concept. good point. So. A force when they destroy humans, they will not hesitate destroying uh, heritage sites. And in in Syria, we saw that there was a, a genocide going on against the, the Shia minorities, the Yazidis, and also the same uh, group destroyed these world heritage sites from the Roman era. Um, the Taliban destruction of uh, Buddha is part of this uh, form of political violence. When they try to kill people, they will also kill the heritage of that people. So genocide and oversight sometimes go hand in hand. At least it has gone hand in hand in places that uh, we have seen uh, violent extremism in, as you said, in the Middle East and also in Afghanistan. Yeah, so it's uh, somehow to destroy the built environment to make an impossible life for the people. Thank you, Ali. And so we are going uh, back maybe to historical background of uh, this discussion because 
uh, the Buddha statue was one of the important historical phenomena in, uh, in the Bamiyan and also part of uh, Gandahara art, uh, which was maybe the first form of uh, Buddha statue because before that, uh, the statue of Buddha was in maybe was forbidden somehow and Buddha symbolized by lotus and by, by other symbols. So in this part, we are going to Abdullah, uh, can you tell us about the construction of Buddha statues? Who built them? When did they build them? Why and how? Uh, thank you, Asad. Uh, let me get this opportunity and thanks uh, Seb Heaven uh, to provide this platform to discuss topics, uh, timely topics like what we are going to discuss today. Uh, to talk about Buddha statues, I think it uh, will be relevant to give a very short background about the Bamiyan city first. So the city of Bamiyan where Buddha statues are located historically was uh, uh, one of the main trade and transit hub along the Silk Road and uh, had a significant place in, uh, in the region economically and culturally. So uh, in addition, the city was uh, located on the route where uh, many military campaigns passed uh, through it in different periods. And each of these foreign forces, you know, these, campaign, uh, these campaigns were uh, passing through these cities or those who have uh, stayed behind from these campaigns, they usually impacted uh, deeply, you know, uh, uh, the, had deep impacts on the political, social, and economic life of the city. From Alexander's uh, military campaigns to the attacks of nomadic tribes from Central Asia, or uh, what we see in later periods, uh, the campaigns of Arabs, uh, Mongols, and uh, Nader Shah. So this geog uh, geographical stand along the Silk Road had uh, led to a kind of, uh, we can say, unique way of uh, social and political life, uh, which uh, put it in close and uh, constant uh, interaction with other people and cultures in neighboring uh, territories or even farther. So the authorities of this region, dynasties who ruled uh, this region uh, were also very active in terms of uh, diplomatic, uh, religious and artistic relationship with uh, other parts of the world. And through this relationship, uh, these interactions, we see uh, that one of the main features of social life in Bamiyan was the cultural diversity and religious tolerance among peoples of this, uh, people of the uh, of Bomia, something that uh, still uh, can be seen in Hazara community in the Valley of Bomia. So uh, about uh, who built Buddha statues in Bamiyan, uh, they were built, uh, they were built in this context by order of Kushan empires, the uh, Buddhas, those who have uh, uh, have been in Bamiya and they have seen that uh, the Buddha fa Buddha's face uh, to south of the Bamiya Valley. And they are about uh, 102 meters apart from, from each other. And between uh, these two statues in the heart of the mountain, there is uh, many cavern caverns that uh, were once uh, places where monks and pilgrims pray and worship. Uh, the two statues came, uh, as Asad mentioned, uh, came from the heart of Gandahara School of Art and uh, Gandahara uh, sculpture are closely uh, related to the uh, Roman art in terms of artistic uh, affiliation. Also, it seems that they, uh, they have some links to the Greek art. So in fact, uh, maybe uh, the best description of uh, Gandahara school, as some, uh, some scholars say, is that uh, Gandahara school of art is, uh, or was the most uh, oriental manifestation of the art of the Roman empire in this part of the world. Uh, Another point uh, I think uh, worth mentioning here is that, uh, so many believe that the statues and other form of, uh, forms of art in Bamiyan and in the region are influenced largely by the conquerors and invaders and they give uh, a passive role to 
local artists. I think we should uh, remember that uh, Bamiyan and uh, Bamiyan statues and the other artistic forms from this region, they only themselves shows the that uh, the fact that artists and craftsmen of Bamiyan Uh, I, I can hear you. Uh, kind of eclectic style and then all affected on, the, on other artistic forms in the region. A very good example of this uh, we can see in uh, uh, Bamiyan painting. Uh, the oil painting that were, uh, that, uh, were artistically a combination of elements, uh, combination of elements from East Roman art, Sasanian Persian art, and Indian subcontinent art. So, the skill of Bamiyan uh, artists in combining these elements where they uh, were, uh, uh, were that they combined them in a such a harmonious way that it's really difficult to say which uh, style is dominant to the, to the others. And then we can see uh, the same eclectic style of Bamiyan painting later in other regions. For example, in uh, Mingo in Central Asia, where we can see the same exact feature of art, uh, art from Bamiyan. And this feature actually gives the statue, the Bamiyan statues, uh, its painting and other historical monuments uh, in the region, the cosmo uh, cosmopolitan nature. So uh, I think we can ask uh, now what this statue, uh, the statues and caverns can tell us about the lives of uh, people in Bamiyan. So uh, one, one thing is, uh, as you mentioned, as Ali mentioned sure. uh, in, in the introduction that it was against a uh, genocide or maybe a, a violence against the urbanity, against the civility. So if I got uh, from your discussion, so Bomyan uh, cultural heritage was very multicultural from different people from different parts of the world, Indian, uh, Rumian, uh, uh, Greek people, and the local people, and uh, also. So uh, if, if we go back again and focus on, on the statue of Buddha, mm -hmm. what was the motivation of those people who built the statue? So, uh, what I can say here is that, uh, you know, what I learned from uh, living in Bamiyan when I look at the Buddha statues is that, uh, you know, these statues themselves, then they can, uh, you know, better than anything depict the cultural, political, and social situation of the city. Uh, Bamiyan was at, uh, uh, at Haile when the statues uh, were built. You know, uh, the, its economy was good. At the, it was the main hub along the Silk Road. It, it, witne uh, it witnessed the presence of various Buddhists and Hindu sects. And in terms of cultural and artistic activities, of course, the city was very dynamic. So at the same time, it was politically active and had important diplomatic uh, relations with other regions. Uh, I think it was after uh, it was almost after this period that uh, gradually in the following centuries with the advent of Islam, you know, the Buddhist life in the region began to decline, and uh, Buddhists those who were living there were were forced to convert to Islam or flee. But uh, if we look closely at the life of Bamiyan people after converting to Islam, we see that uh, here again uh, people uh, instead of uh, rejecting Islam or abandoning Buddhism altogether, they try to preserve uh, elements of the, uh, uh, you know, different elements of the Buddhist religions in their daily life. And in some occasion, they even integrated it with Islamic values. We had, uh, uh, we have its manifestation in the religious to uh, tolerance of Bamiyan people uh, under the rule of Islam to this day. Uh, the Buddha statues were. Uh, um, stood uh, in the heart of Bamiyan Valley uh, for centuries and 
although the people of Bamiyan converted to, the, to Islam, not only they never destroyed this statue, but they always uh, uh, see them as part of their identity. What uh, destroyed the Buddha statues in 2001 was uh, quite the opposite of the diversity and to uh, tolerance of uh, Bamiyan people. It was a force from you know, coming outside of uh, Bamiyan to destroy the statue. Uh, uh, for, I'm going to start uh, here because I'm sure uh, Ali has a lot to say when, uh, yes, about the, the about the process of destruction or the history of destruction of the his uh, statues. Yeah. Sorry, Asad, over to you. So for uh, just a quick question, and then we for the, the history of destruction, we will ask Ali. So Bomian statue was a form of Gandahara art. And it's made uh, by Kushanian Empire. So uh, it was the first time maybe the king asked people, I want to see the face of Buddha. Exactly. So one of the interesting point about the school of uh, art in Gandahara is that the first time, for the first time, we see Buddha in, in a human form in the Gandahara School of Art. So it's, uh, it's said that Kanishka, the great uh, Kushan Empire wanted to see, you know, as, uh, you know, he was, a, uh, uh, he was very supportive of the Buddhists and he wanted to see actually Buddha. So that's, uh, that was when uh, the uh, followers of, you know, the uh, artists and craftsmen under the empire, uh, Kushan Empire, or they just, uh, you know, they uh, started to, uh, to come up with the statues, with the human, you know, with the human form of Buddha in this culture, uh, in Gandhara sculpture. Uh, thank you, Abdullah. Um, it's a very, very uh, good answer. And we are going to Ali. So uh, the other uh, coin of this uh, question is the destroying of uh, Buddha, because the destroying of Buddha statue also has a very long history in 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 Bamiyan. Uh, maybe there have been other attempts in history to destroy. Bamiyan Buddhas almost from the arriving of Islam in Bamiyan. Uh, can you Ali tell us more about uh, this previous attempts? Sure. Uh, so the history of uh, Bamiyan Buddhas are somehow tied to the history of uh, Islam. Uh, the smaller Buddha was built in 570. That is about 39 years before Muhammad uh, uh, declared his prophecy in Arabia. The bigger Buddha was built in 618. So Muhammad uh, declared his prophecy, the prophet of Islam, in 609. That is at the beginning of uh, the seventh century almost. So uh, they were still building the Buddha status in Bamiyan when Muhammad declared his prophecy and invited people to join Islam. But Islam did not reach uh, Bamiyan for some time. Uh, and for all these uh, uh, histories that followed, all these centuries that followed, several invading armies, Muslim invading armies arrived in Bamiyan in order to convert people to Islam or to conquer this valley. And although some of them, they uh, spared the Buddhas, but uh, some of them attempted to destroy this because this was such a huge, prominent uh, relic uh, demonstrating the culture and heritage of non-Islamic past of this valley. So the, the history, the entire history of this study uh, is uh, the post-Islamic history, because as I said, they were built right at the beginning of uh, the arrival of Islam in, in, in Arabia. And uh, among the uh, many invading armies who arrived in Bamiyan to conquer it or to destroy the Buddhas, one was um, a ninth century um, a dynasty 
uh, from uh, Nimruz province in southwest of Afghanistan. They were called the Safarids. They arrived there and they, uh, the, the valley of Bamiyan was still a very much a Buddhist city. There were monasteries, there were uh, all other forms of religious sites other than the two big Buddhas. So this, they destroyed these things that were on flat lands. They destroyed the monasteries, they took some of the statues and sent them to Baghdad as form of souvenir for the Caliph. And uh, they didn't have the technology and the know-how to destroy the giant Buddhas, and that's how the Buddhas survived. But, uh, uh, and, and, and still, after the Safarids in the ninth century, Bamiyan started to become Muslim, but it did not become fully Muslim until the 10th century when the Ghaznavid came. The Ghaznavid converted the entire area to Islam and there were no practicing Buddhists left in Bamiyan in the 10th century. And uh, the Ghaznavid did not destroy, of course, uh, the Buddhas, the Buddhas survived. It was later on in the 17th century, in almost modern times, that a Mughal uh, emperor from India, Aurangzeb, a famously uh, Islamist uh, and very religious uh, ruler who was uh, famous for his intolerance of non-Muslim, who attempted to destroy the Buddha. In, in addition to being a very extremist person, he was also very good at military. He would uh, build uh, this uh, big cannon, guns, and come up with new strategies for the Indian army. And one of the new guns that he built, he sent that to Bamiyan. At the time, Bamiyan and Kabul was part of the Indian Empire, it was a province or suba of the Indian Mughal Empire. To test it on the Buddha, they wanted to test the gun on the Buddha. So they fired at the Buddha, uh, but they could not destroy it completely. But this, they destroyed the legs of the statue. So if you look at uh, pictures of Buddha, the legs are gone, at least one of them is gone. That, those legs were destroyed by Aurangzeb. So that person was the, um, the newest uh, ruler who wanted to destroy this, uh, um, this heritage in order uh, first to erase the non-Islamic uh, heritage of this valley and also test his guns. Uh, then a century later, uh, Nadir Afshar arrived, and also it is noted that he tried to destroy the Buddhas, but he failed. And uh, after that, the Buddha remained uh, in Bamiyan, almost intact. Uh, it was not um, destroyed, it was a site of wonder tourists. Of, uh, the British would come to, to Bamiyan and uh, um, paint it and make drawings of it and report about it. Uh, uh, Orientalists, everyone was fascinated by this site. So it it was several. There were several attempts uh, by previous rulers of uh, Bamiyan and Afghanistan who came to destroy it, but they did not uh, have the capacity the technical capacity to destroy completely these two giant Buddhas. And it was, of course, the Taliban who finally managed to destroy it. So the Taliban too, they started in the 1990s towards, I think, 1999. They um, started to do, to blow up the head of the Buddha. So the head of the Buddha uh, is um, a, a bit, uh, um, controversial because it, its face is erased. The ears and the chin and the lips uh, were visible, visible, but the eyes and the forehead and the nose were gone. Um, some local historians would speculate that uh, probably because the Buddhas looked like a Hazarat, somebody came and they didn't like Hazaras, they just erased the face. But uh, archaeologists, they believe that no, it is part of the design of the Buddha, it's part of the, the original feature. They did not build the face; they just lived it just blank. Um, I don't know. I think I, I I cannot take sides on this because this is not my area of specialty. I think um, ancient historians or uh, archaeologists should have better explanation for this. But what Taliban did, they tried to blow up the face and the head. Sorry, 
uh, they they actually blew up some part of the, the, the head, but not all of it, but they did not continue. They left it unfinished until 2001. So one thing about the head of the Buddha, I would say that uh, all these Islamic ext extremists that they are against uh, this uh, un-Islamic icons, uh, they have uh, this rigid view that uh, the building a statue or even painting a living being is on Islamic, it is challenging the authority of God that, yeah, I can also make a living being. So in order to destroy this, what they do is they behead the artistic object. If it is a painting, they just uh, cut the head where it is a, a statue, they would destroy the head. So destroying the head signifies that we have killed this art object. So it, not only in Afghanistan, uh, in India, in the Middle East, uh, many times when this uh, extremists, they want to destroy um, artistic objects like paintings or, um, or a status, they start with the head. But of course, in 2001, the Taliban, in an act of uh, extreme, extreme um, um, violence against the history of not only this region, but also the history and heritage of the world, they blew up the entire thing. Uh, and um, they, they, uh, they finished something that previous generations of extremists uh, failed to accomplish. Uh, thank you. As you told, the beheading is a very uh, strong tradition in Islam when they uh, captured the enemy, so they beheaded, uh, when they even killed the enemy, so they beheaded, it was a symbol of to be mean or defeated of enemy. Uh, so as you mentioned, Abdullah, before that, uh, there is a very, very close relationship between Bamiyan people and uh, this cultural heritage and somehow the statue of Buddha and the Bamiyan mountains are the mirror of uh, these people and they show uh, the rising and collapsing of these people and the humiliating of them and maybe to construct them or reconstruct them. So there is a mainstream narrative if you come in today that they believe the Buddha statue destroyed in Bamiyan, it was just because of religious interpretation of that statue. So the question is, is what's the political meaning of uh, destruction, destroying of Buddha statue by Taliban? Is it just a religious interpretation of that or maybe uh, there is other reason also? Uh, good question. Yes. Uh, whenever there is a discussion about uh, destruction of Buddha statues, usually the first reason behind the destruction mentioned is the uh, religious fundamentalism that uh, uh, it was uh, the result of Taliban religious ideology or that the Taliban saw it as a symbol of uh, idolatry or politism. But uh, I think reducing this act of this uh, destruction to a religious motive is a kind of uh, a simplification of the issue as, uh, yeah. So as Ali said, if we look at the history of, the re uh, of this region, there have been people uh, who try to destroy these statues. And all of these people movements kind of came from outside of the region, outside of Bamiyan, whether it be Nader Shah, Ghaznavid or Aurangzeb. So they all had their own motives. There was a religious motive in all of them. However, uh, for the Taliban, I think there is another aspect that has uh, that a uh, few, you know, it, it didn't receive much attention yet. And it's uh, the, the ethnic nationalism, which goes hand to hand with religious fundamentalism here uh, in Afghanistan. If we ignore this link without looking at the context in the Afghanistan contemporary history, it will mislead us. I think the act of uh, destructing uh, Bamiyan uh, statues is uh, one of a series of uh, measures that uh, have been going on in Afghanistan for more than two centuries in order to reshape the history of this, con uh, this country, as Ali mentioned. And 
uh, reshaping this uh, history means uh, destroying the past and anything that has uh, any relation to it and uh, anything that can confront with the newly forged history. Whether it's a text, it's a book, it's a monument, sto uh, story, uh, an ar uh, archaeological site, or even people themselves. So uh, the Taliban reason uh, for destroying the Buddha must be understood in line uh, with the efforts of the late uh, Pashtun dominated government in Afghanistan, who tried to rewrite the country's history and come up with a fake, a fake Afghan identity. Uh, if we look at the history closely, we see that after Ahmad Shah become, uh, became a king, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in 1747, and uh, with the formation of the you know, so-called Af uh, so Afghanistan, we witnessed that the attempts to create this new distorted history or uh, all the time accompanied uh, by the destruction of history and the demolition of anything that relate uh, this land to its indigenous people, including the in, uh, destruction of Buddha, uh, Buddha, Buddhist heritage in Bamiyan. Uh, it was in 16th centuries that Pashtuns came, to, uh, came from India to the areas which is now Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, border areas. And they took power in the context of conflict between India, Mughal Empire, and the Safavid in Iraq. Uh, the, this region, this borderland between Pakistan and Afghanistan was the main Afghanistan before, uh, before the colonial intervention. And uh, later in the context of the great game between Britain and Russia, the Pashtun managed to extend their power over most part of the country and took control of central and northern Afghanistan by physically eliminating and killing different ethnic groups. And, uh, since uh, these new rulers of the regions were not originally from there, they were alien, they were uh, unfamiliar with the culture of this region, the culture of Bach, the culture of Bamiyan, the culture of Herat, and therefore they took a hostile approach toward them. And uh, it was here that uh, efforts, the effort to uh, you know, intensify to uh, uh, change, you know, uh, to destroy the past and history uh, to history of these uh, areas uh, by any means possible. For example, they began to change the names of historical and ancient sites and replace them with, uh, replaced many Dari and uh, other lo local names with Pashtun names. Uh, forced displacement also began in, in a scale that uh, the demographic com uh, composition of the region changed significantly, and many Hazara, Tajik, and Uzbek residents in south, north, and east of the country were forcibly displaced. At the same time, institutions with the uh, full support of the government were formed uh, to formally begin to create a nationalist narrative, uh, institution like Anjuman Tariq or Academy of Science. They also started to create this false myths and stories to give legitimacy to their national narratives. And the result was nothing but absolute chaos uh, in the current Afghanistan historiography that we witness today. For example, uh, according to this nationalist, uh, just to give an example, this uh, national narrative. So it claims a five year, 5,000 year history for Pashtuns. And by this claim, they are trying not only to destroy and of course this distort history, but to confiscate uh, the history of other ethnic groups. And unfortunately, this situation still continues even more than before. For example, uh, as uh, Dr. Karibi already pointed out in one of his interviews, the government of Ashraf Ghani selectively reconstructs the past and historical monuments in the last uh, 10 years. We saw that large sums of money were spent on the reconstruction of, uh, reconstruction of Dora Lemon Palace, Saraji, and other works uh, that were made by recent Pashtun rulers in the 19th and 20th, 20th century. But the cultural heritage of other people like Manor John, the historical sites in Herat, in Bamiyan, in Ghazni, they were intentionally ignored by the government. By the government. 
they uh, they uh, I mean the government they selectively choose which part of the history should be bought and highlighted and which part should be ignored and left to be forgotten. Uh, in one word, the destruction of Buddha statues as a historical and cultural heritage of uh, Hazara people must be understood in the context of uh, a kind of wider pro uh, process of cultural, social, and political exclusion of Hazara people from the society. Now that the Taliban are back in power, the situation will become worse for uh, Hazara, uh, even uh, uh, worse than before, as we can see these days. Uh, and it's because the Taliban is not just a religious ideology, but uh, an ethnic process in, in its nature. And religion uh, is just a political tool for, uh, tool, uh, for them to uh, cover this fact. Uh, thank you, Abdullah. As we told, so the destruction of uh, Buddha statue is a part of uh, maybe a reconstructing of uh, ethno-nationalism history. So it was not uh, just, it, helped, uh, it doesn't have just a religious uh, message. It is a kind of uh, uh, distortion of collective memory, distortion of uh, history. I know we come back again to Ali Karimi, I think we uh, don't have so much time. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, Ali, uh, as Abdullah mentioned, uh, there is an understanding that there is a relationship between uh, people who are living or uh, in Bamiyan and this cultural heritage and uh, this history. So as you know, that these two statues were located in uh, Bamiyan, which is somehow the uh, Hazara uh, cultural center. So what is the relationship of uh, Bamiyan people with this cultural heritage in today? So how, what do you think about that? Uh, <clears throat> the relationship between people and their pre-Islamic heritage is always complicated. We see that in uh, Egypt, we see that in Iran, other Muslim countries, uh, they are, uh, there are, first debates and also uh, mixed feelings about these uh, sites. They are not sure that should we be proud of this uh, un-Islamic uh, past or we should forget them. So um, I think a few years ago in, in Egypt, they uh, organized this parade with uh, ancient pharaohs and kings on the street. Um, but the Egyptians who are a, a, large portion of the society are very conservative. They said, no, don't bring them back. We are Egyptians or Muslims, and we are only proud of our Islamic heritage. In Iran, this debate is going on. But even though the Iran, Iranian regime is a, a very much a conservative Islamic uh, government, they are uh, trying to bring back some of the pre-Islamic Iranian heritage. The Shah was more uh, proactive. He, he was mm, trying to uh, um, re reinvent the contemporary Iran in the image of this ancient Persian past, even changing the calendar of, of the country to the ancient calendar. So when it comes to Afghanistan, um, this complicated history um, it, is there. People, not only the Hazaras, but other ethnic groups too, they have uh, um, a, a very a strange feeling and ideas about their own pre-Islamic past uh, because of this long history of suppression. They don't remember much about the past. The, our only evidence is this material heritage the remnants of this pre-Islamic era. Uh, but we don't know much about them because uh, the Islamic culture and the Arab culture has been very overwhelming. Uh, it washed out the previous uh, memories and cultures and identities of people. So, but when it comes to uh, the Hazaras in Bamiyan, they have a very interesting relationship with these two giant Buddhas. Although uh, Buddhist beliefs no longer exist in Bamiyan, 
but uh, people are not a stranger to these two sides. They are not antagonistic against these two sides. They appreciate them. They make up stories about them. Uh, among the locals, this the smaller Buddha is called uh, Shamaman, the larger one is called Salsal, and the smaller one is perceived as a female figure, and the larger one as male. So they have built up these stories, uh, folkloric tales, poetry about these two giant Buddhas, and they have this intimate relationship with them, but not in a religious way. They are still Muslims. They still believe uh, in uh, Shia or Sunni Islam, but uh, they they have no desire, I think, to return to Buddhist beliefs. But they 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 see these sites as their own. They don't see them as some stranger things that they have nothing to do with. So that's different from, uh, let's say, the Pashtun rulers who are originally from uh, northern Pakistan. Uh, from the Sulaiman mountain range area, when they colonized, uh, colonized Afghanistan and settled there, the entire region of Khorasan was a stranger to them. The Persian language was a stranger, the heritage, the Buddhist heritage, the, uh, the, the other uh, physical and material uh, sites that existed in this region were, was a stranger to them. So they tried either to destroy them or to neglect them and let them be destroyed. So um, in, in the case of the Hazaras, so there is a myth going on for at least the 19th century or before that the Hazaras are Mongols. They are the remnants of uh, the Genghis Khan's army in the Bamiyan region. But that is not true. There is no evidence suggesting that Genghis left a portion of his army in a very remote mountainous area like Bamiyan. Um, and in, in my view, and according to uh, historical evidence that uh, there's not a lot of research going on about this, but the Hazaras are indigenous to this region, to the region of Khorasan. And uh, because of their faith, uh, they have been pushed further and further into the highlands in the central Afghanistan. So if we don't have Hazaras today in Kandahar, that's because in the 19th century, their lands were confiscated. They were pushed into the uh, mountains. Um, we don't have Hazaras um, in, 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 in some parts of, uh, for example, uh, between Kabul and Ghazni and, and, and Kandahar, this region in Herat. Oh, because of all this mass uh, depopulation and displacement going on in the history. So uh, the Hazaras are indigenous to the area and they have a very intimate relationship with these Buddhist sites, although they do not view them as religious sites, as uh, sacred um, uh, um, symbols. They view them as more of folkloric and cultural sites as part of their own history. So they don't have um, antagonistic relationship with the, with the pre-Islamic uh, past of their valley. The same that's going on with, let's say, uh, Muslim extremists in some parts of uh, the Middle East, that they don't want anything to do with the pre-Islamic uh, heritage of their nations. Uh, thank you, Ali. As you told, so the Bamiyan people always try to reconstruct themselves in this cultural heritage and find a way to see themselves and find themselves even in, in place of uh, Buddha statue in Bamiyan. And uh, we have very few time and I want to ask the last question from Abdullah. Uh, it was Heinrich Heine told that the people who burn the book, so they will burn the people. So we can have the same question, the people who uh, kill the cultural heritage, uh, can kill the people. So what is the relationship between this uh, cultural genocide and genocide in Afghanistan? Uh, well, uh, I'm not an expert in law or international, international law, and I can define genocide and cultural genocide in their strict legal terms, but uh, 
Uh, well, a uh, general definition of genocide. So it's a systematic attempt to destroy a group, whether for political ties, religious, ethnic background, or other reasons. But cultural genocide is one of the concept uh, when it comes to Afghanistan, I rarely uh, heard it to use it, you know, uh, about uh, what happened in Afghanistan. When we look at the 18th century, we see the genocide of Hazaras under Abdurrahman rule along with other systematic efforts to remove these uh, people from the social and political life of Afghanistan. I think the point here uh, to keep in mind is that a genocide in its, I don't know if I'm using the right sense or not, in physical sense, uh, we cannot separate it from uh, cultural genocide. And uh, from cultural genocide here, I mean uh, the destruction of the identity of a group because the identity of each group is uh, generally defined by the culture of culture of the uh, of that group. In cultural genocide, which uh, which make a different stage, sometimes before the genocide itself, and sometimes along with it. Uh, so the oppressors' uh, attempts are made uh, to violently target the culture that holds the group together like a glue and uh, in order to break to break up the group once it's done people do, don't see you know uh, much choices ahead of them so other than to either be, to be assimilated in the other in, in, uh, in the dominant culture which is a very painful process or uh, get surrender and in some occasions even physically eliminated this is why the destruction of cultural and historical symbols for me is is uh, in itself a kind of genocide. And we cannot separate these two uh, from each other. What mm -hmm. happened in, in the destruction of the Buddha statues is in fact, deliberate destruction, uh, destruction of the identity of Hazaras. And uh, I think it's not fair to justify this uh, act simply by uh, idolatry because uh, these statues belong to past centuries and they're now empty of their religious meaning, and they are only silent, kind of silent si signs of an ancient civilization. I think calling uh, this act destruction of Buddha statues as a war crime by the international community is a kind of uh, ignoring and turning a blind eye to the, uh, to the fact uh, that this act is a kind of destruction of culture and uh, identities of uh, Hazaras we have seen this, prof, uh, this process, of course, in other parts of the world. In uh, uh, in 70s, 1970s, uh, the Khmer Rouge communist regime in Cambodia massacred people and then at the same time destroyed temples, Muslim mosques, churches, and um, uh, Buddhist statues. And uh, two decades later, in Ser uh, Serbia, uh, uh, destroyed all libraries, mosques, and other religious and cultural sites all belonging to uh, Bosnian Muslims. Uh, or, or what ISIS did in Iraq and Syria. So these are all examples of uh, cultural genocide and uh, the destruction of this cultural heritage is not just a destruction of stone or wooden or other material works of art, but uh, these structures are the proof of, uh, proof of existence for people. And their destructions means to deliberately make a group of people to disappear from uh, uh, history. And the quoted asset mentioned from the Heinrich China, I think, yeah, yeah, the same is true here. Those who destroy a people's cultural heritage won't have any fear to kill and massacre those people. We have witnessed this so many times in human history that uh, we can say that the destruction of Bamiyan Buddhas is an act of, the, uh, act of cultural heritage and uh, ignoring it or reducing it to something like a criminal act will make Taliban and other group with the same mindset to become more aggressive in their na nationalist uh, agendas. Uh, thank you, Ali, and thank you, Abdullah. It was a very nice discussion. Uh, do you want Ali to add a few sentences because we don't have so much time? Yeah, I noticed that we're running out of time. 
uh, I just want to uh, stress the fact that Afghanistan as a whole, as a very diverse country, it is not one country with one people. The word Afghan alone is not enough to cover the entire population, uh, to understand Afghanistan, to understand the conflict in Afghanistan. Uh, we need to look at the, the cultural diversity of this country and to understand um, different peoples, different histories and identities. And when it comes to uh, the Hazaras, the experience of the Hazaras throughout the modern history of Afghanistan is a very good way to understand the true politics, the culture of this country. Um, and uh, especially it, it is true now that um, uh, the Taliban is ruling the, the country. We, we, we sometimes hear uh, from foreign uh, reporters to go, oh, Afghanistan's war has ended. Now it is so peaceful. You can travel everywhere. It, there is security everywhere. But that is false. If you want to assess the situation, the security in Afghanistan, ask the Hazaras. Hazaras, the war against the Hazaras is still going on. Last week, hundreds of school kids were blown up uh, in a suicide attack. Uh, at least 13 to 16, the numbers are not known. 60 worshippers in in just the day after the bomb on the schools. So the, this brutal war, the mass killing of the Hazaras is still going on while far, uh, foreign reporters go to Taliban and talk to them and just have tea with them and then write that, oh, Afghanistan is so peaceful, there's no war going on. Yes, the war against the Pashtun is going on because the Taliban were doing the war. But the war the, against the Hazaras is still going on, the same as it went on for 20 years and also before that um, uh, throughout the uh, modern history of this country. So acknowledging that Af Afghan is not the right way to describe this country, there is, there is diversity of people, is one way to understand this country and uh, possibly um, uh, have a more uh, constructive dialogue uh, about uh, its history, about its politics, and possibly about its future. Uh, thank you very much, Ali, and thank you very much, uh, Abdullah. Abdullah, do you want to add some sentences? Uh, thank you, Milton, uh, Munira, uh, Safe Haven, Teotrus, and uh, everybody. Thank you very much.